No, this is great. So uh, we are live and um, I welcome whoever is here with us. I'm Bonita Woods and I am here with, in the top corner, my mother, Ursi Potter, who, and then we have Nancy, is it Ayana? Why? Ayana is a name I was given a, back in 68 as an honorary black woman, which I just love it. And I've kept it ever since. And most of the people in the metaphysical healing communities know me by that name. Oh, that is lovely. That is lovely. Then we definitely need to talk sometime so I can hear the stories behind you receiving this uh, wonderful honorary name. Yeah, it was astounding. And of course, Dr. Daryl Thorne, who we all love and love to listen to. Um, so I, I called these ladies here. Um, of course, you guys have probably heard Daryl and me talk a great deal about what's happening in our, in our country and our planet these days. And um, I invited my mother, Ursi, and... Nancy to join us because they have uh, they have both been involved with human rights and civil rights um, activism for decades. Decades, be polite. <laughs> decades. <laughs> we were both born troublemakers. <laughs> uh, for those of you who do not know. Ursi raised me going to protest marches in DC. <laughs> oh. Oh. Um, so some things have come to my mind um, and I'm just going to put out there the issue that that has been bothering me because I, I don't see it as a fresh now issue. So I wanted us, the four of us to talk to see about what's happening now, but also some of the historical context and the roots. All right, so our government put out the small business pandemic loans with a series of loans that would be forgiven if you met certain categories. The majority of these loans, as everyone is now aware, were eaten up by big businesses. They, they were not put to the very small businesses. I'm a small business owner. I applied for the loan and was basically laughed out of the bank for my um, inability to supply the level of data they needed to procure said loan. Um, and for me, you know, but my bookkeeping is good, but no, I'm not a professional bookkeeper. Um, however, I know people who had an attorney and an accountant paid two weeks solid putting together the level of documentation to have an application that was literally five, six inches of paper showing in five different data accruement platforms how they pay their employees and how much and proving that they do. It was insane. I have never seen any loan require this level of data and detail, way above and beyond what the majority of small business owners could supply. So it's no wonder then that it got eaten up by, you know, and also the majority of small business owners, the payroll is not anywhere close to your largest expense, mm -hmm. but that was all that this loan would really cover. Um, so I had some issues with that. And as a small business owner who have, you know, who has people who work with me, I was trying to help float us all through this. You know, I had to rely on other methods, like just work really, really hard at my business and cut my expenses way down and uh, do without a lot of personal luxuries. So we have small businesses that are floundering. The unemployment rate has skyrocketed to levels that left the depression way behind in numbers. We have crushed the Great Depression. Um, the small business owners, if we applied for a pandemic 
unemployment insurance, which we were then told to do, self-employed and small business owners, and have our employees apply for uh, pandemic unemployment insurance. If you work, you lose your insurance, you lose the pandemic. So if you try to keep your business going and bring income coming in, if any of it goes to payroll, you lose that money. So there requires a great deal of documentation to prove if you get this money that if your business is functioning, no one's getting paid. It's, you know, really. And then now we've hit the point where the pandemic insurance is gone. Unemployment is not in a good state. People are being evicted from their homes. Uh, the moratorium on evictions has diminished. Literally, at this moment, they're counting 23 million Americans uh, who are in jeopardy of being evicted in the month of August. These 23 million Americans, many of them are unemployed. At the same time, um, if you have the pandemic insurance, you cannot apply for uh, Medicaid, SNAP, TANF, any of that stuff, because the, the pandemic insurance, which is taxable, raises your income above what Medicaid, SNAP, and TANF will support. Anything you get on the pandemic, you are going to have to pay taxes on. Our government has now issued everyone who is on Medicaid, receives SNAP, TANF, you know, food stamps, must reapply this month or they will lose their services. They will lose their support. If you were on Medicaid and you got pandemic insurance, odds are you will most likely lose it, lose your food stamps, lose your health insurance, lose your Medicaid care because the pandemic unemployment would have raised your income too high. I can tell you in the state of Virginia, it's generally roughly $15,000 a year for a single mother with one child. If you earn above $15,500, you do not earn, you earn too much to receive Medicaid and food stamps. You're educating me because I did not even know the last about 10 paragraphs of what you said. <laughs> Well, this is why I said I feel like I need that famous conspiracy board with yarn going across it. Yeah. So we are now about to have literally 23 million is the estimate. And you know, as we've learned in the pandemic, the estimate is usually a small percentage of what will be the crushing reality. About to be homeless, unemployed, in the midst of a health crisis, a highly infectious contagion, um, you cannot get, it's really, really hard to get any kind of Medicaid or benefits when you're homeless. Mm -hmm. So just put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so we have 23 million people who are about to be homeless, unemployed, ineligible for benefits in a highly contagious environment landlords who the government has said they're not going to get any government bailouts of any sort for like not being able to pay their bills. Any support that they received is done. So if they don't have anyone paying rent, they have no income to pay their bills. We're about to have empty buildings. Of course, who will benefit from empty buildings that need to be sold while predominantly, Daryl, would you say black and brown skinned people, low, as well as the general low income? Low income, yeah, and low income airport white people are going to be clearly affected the most. And then, because you're, we talked about this earlier that, that I still consider you to be the designated expert on this particular conversation, but what I will uh, chime in with in, in connect to is that in everything that you said, there are also children involved, right? Right. A lot of folks who are reliant on the air quote system in some form or fashion have children. You know, they, they are, they have people that they are required and want to care for. You know, they're not just alone or seniors who are 
really not able to work anymore. Like they've, they've done their part and they just are not able to, to work, right? To bring just an income. And then, as you said, talk about the unemployment rates right now. We have people, I mean, my son was one of them who just graduated from college, the class of 2020. He's working a temporary job. He was lucky to get that, you know? So there are so many things at play. Um, and with the, the pandemic and the decisions that are being made by this crazy, crazy, crazy administration, it's just making things so much worse. You know, um, I can chime this really quickly. So you all know I'm always reading something. I just literally just started. I've had this book for a couple of years, but The Color of Law, I can't really tell you guys too much about it yet because I literally just started reading it. Um, but what I can tell you is that it it connects with some of what Benita's talking about in terms of the policy end. And of course, law is policy and how it disproportionately affects um, primarily black and brown folk, but also um, low income people of whiteness. But I love saying the people of whiteness just because of the color thing, you know, equity um, in all things. But the country was founded on policies that are so disproportionate. They set up the majority of people in this country to fail. However you wanna characterize or define the word fail, um, and not, not us as individuals. I wanna make that clear, regardless of how you've been positioned in the categorization of your skin color and what that means. It has really positioned the majority of us to not thrive. And that's exactly what Benita was talking about. And now this pandemic doesn't help. The other book that I started reading, you know, I, I try to start reading multiple things at one time. Also at the same time, Dying of Whiteness. This, you guys, is really interesting because it starts off talking about Trump and his administration and how it has really, the, the base, Trump's base, are affected worse than what they could have imagined. Now, I, I'm mm -hmm. sure to say the four of us on this call could have told y'all that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, won't well, listen. So this, this goes into... Um, a lot of what we're seeing, and this book was written, I guess, around in 2000, they have information about 2016. So pre all of what we're experiencing now. So there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. There is, I worked with homeless people in DC from 1986 to 1992 or three. And uh, some of those people were families in shelters. And I just can't comprehend the lawmakers not understanding the consequences of this of these policies and the lack of giving people money when you have millions of people who become homeless not only are they hungry they have no choice but in some cases to turn to crime to try to steal food or clothing or whatever whatever and one of the most heartrending things uh, in the stories that i collected and authored which were real about real people and their real experience was like a little girl who was bemoaning the fact that when they had a house, her mommy and daddy were always kissing and hugging. But now that they were in a the shelter, they were fighting all the time and it was like they didn't even like each other anymore. And so who is she turning to but the local drug pusher who's grooming her, telling her how pretty she is and how he'll take care of her and now she trusts him and she's living in this hellhole in the house. It, the house being the shelter where hot plates are not allowed for food even. And there are fires like once or twice a week because people are using hot plates. It, the ramifications just go on. And if people don't have human compassion, they ought to at least look at it from the standpoint of another script I wrote which is what kinds of citizens do you think these people are going to become as they grow up when they've not had a home, they've not had education, they've not understood civics, they haven't been uh, cooperatively working for anything other than survival. So the short-sightedness of, and back to that point, the people who are the most supportive in the populace are the ones who are the most whose interests are the least well-served by this administration. 
and it's all going to catch up. Okay, end of sermon. Sorry about that. <laughs> that, no, no, no. <laughs> that was brilliant. Thank you. Um, and I would like to um, actually bring segue this to my mom because with so many people about to become homeless, unless, you know, something happens last minute in our government to, quote, save the day from the traumas that the government is bringing to us, um, Trump, Trump's response is to speak up publicly and loudly saying, hey, suburbanites, don't worry, I'm going to protect you, you know. I want to language people. Yeah, yes. So me. <laughs> <laughs> but now my mother has been involved with fair housing. Um, so mom, can you talk to us about like your original connection with fair housing and what you all did? Why? Well, um, I grew up in a widow artist community in New York. And I, when I came down to Washington, the first time I went into Woodward and Lothrop. I was young. I was a kid. I went to Woodward and Lothrop and saw um, colored white bathrooms. And it shook. It, it just, I thought, this is the South that I heard about. And I didn't know what to do. I'm sure I went into the one that said colored because I couldn't possibly go into the one that said white. But that's, um, you grow up one way and then you're faced with these other realities in society that are very uh, mystifying. Mm -hmm. And mom, if I can in interject, this was in Arlington, Virginia, right? Yes. And, and you might need to clarify, Ms. Potter, to uh, the folks who are kind of just joining us, that the way I understood um, what you just said, and also based on what Benita has shared in previous conversations we've had, the reason that you went into the colored bathroom was because you guys are Jewish, right? Oh, it just... Yes, I just wanted you to share with the audience. <laughs> well, I can say my mom went in because she's not going to go into a white only bathroom. But yes, our Jewish background would have us barred from plenty of white only. Well, I, I, I don't know that it's that because I don't like to be characterized as an amazing mother and amazing father. Of course, I didn't know that till I left home. <laughs> and, uh, my parents, my mother wasn't Jewish, my father was. And they, um, they're just deeply moral people. And I don't really think that, you know, religion is so pushed in the society, but I think that you're either moral or you're not. Like Jimmy Carter attributes his faith to the fact that he's a good man. And I said, no, he's a good man. He just is. You said you saw like a bulletin board or some uh, bulletin board or something promoting uh, a housing or like what got you to have your epiphany that we needed fair housing in Virginia? Yeah, because that was in the 70s, right? Uh, it was in the 60s. 60s, okay. So we went to live, in, I don't know, just, um, we, we went to live in Europe with the U.S. government and came back and uh, I discovered the house that we had bought before we left. We sold it because we had bought land that we we're building on. And I discovered in there is a clause, this is when we we're selling it. And I was reading it that I would not sell to Jews or to blacks. Then I'm sure they used a different word then. And it was so pervasive when I came back from 
Europe and I went to get my driver's license in Arlington. There was this, on a big house in Arlington, was a sign, um, white men fight back. And it seemed as though I was surrounded by it. And I, I didn't know what to do, it was them. <laughs> it wasn't us. And, and um, finding one's way in the group, you find like-minded people. There actually were wonderful people whom I met through the Unitarian Church. When, when I, I discovered, that's right, I discovered that uh, Black people could not borrow money from a bank for to buy a house. And so it was a group that formed to go through Northern Virginia and say, do you disapprove of this? Will you sign this with us that this is unfair? And so Benita was tiny <laughs> and I, so I put her in a stroller and I'd go from house to house. I always had Benita with me. My little adorable little daughter was my buffer <laughs> and asked people. And, um, and, it, and that was when I also discovered that black people paid more for a house than white people did because they didn't have the choice. It, it was the real estate people deciding, oh, this will go black, this will go white. And the black said, no choice. And it, everything seemed unfair. And uh, I should say, I would like to say something that my, my father told me when I was a child, and this is something I've not said out in public here like this, but these things that you start trying to figure out, why do I think differently? My father told me when I was a child that black people in the South are more intelligent than the white people. And I thought, that's interesting, you know, I didn't learn that. And he said, they have to be, they have to have all their senses aware all the time. With oh, I like your daddy. Yeah. I like your daddy. I like him. I, like him. I am so grateful. I like him. I'm so grateful. Yeah. I mean, this is a long time ago. Mm -hmm. We are saying yeah. this, but it, it made Brighten something in my brain also that made me realize that people who are underprivileged have to work harder for everything that they have. Mm -hmm. And so but you got involved with, you said like a senator's wife to start oh, the oh, that was, was Native Fred, American. Yeah, that was that was Fred Fred Harris, who was the senator from Oklahoma. And this was the time right after Dr. King was killed. And we, they finally got the fair housing law. And Fred Harris, Senator Harris of Oklahoma was one of the people who um, was the, the leaders in this. And he lived in McLean and we had just built our house in McLean and I felt the need, we didn't have a fair housing law, a fair housing group, I felt the need for it. And it turned out that, that Senator Harris's wife, LaDonna Harris, was actually Native American. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, oh, I'll help you form a fair housing group because I know all about it. So with LaDonna Harris's help, we formed our first fair housing group in McLean. Can you, can you explain, I feel like I'm taking over your interviewer, oh. but can you, Mrs. Potter, explain to everybody the essence of the Fair Housing Act? 
because there might be um, some people who don't um, know. You addressed redlining, which is where communities are, are, are segmented off and typically the less desirable areas are kind of uh, reserved for, for black folk and they're pushed into yeah. black yeah. folk or people who are not considered yeah. white. Yeah. And you know, yeah. that, all of that. True. But can you talk about? But, but that, well, Chris, there are different issues there because this is after fair housing which still didn't help a lot. Uh, but I also belong to another group. This is later on, uh, COOL, Committee for Open Occupancy Legislation, when we realized that minorities were stuck along Dulles Airport in that corridor. And they were far from jobs. There was, they were, it was there. It was a get out of their attorney. So, our committee, we we spoke to Fairfax County, and we learned that what you have to do is not prove that these people. Uh, it, it's unfair to them. You have to prove the county needs these people. And so that was what, uh, and cool, we, we got this legislation passed in which um, when housing developments were being built, it had to be over a certain number of, of houses. You had to put in low and moderate cost housing mm -hmm. in that same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We had to prove is that policemen and uh, teachers and people who serviced us and our children could not afford to live here. So it was the goal to prove the county needed this. And I thought that was very interesting, you know, having more than that anything that I did with the county afterwards. It was always what the county needs for the county to survive. Right. So this was the beginning of the Affordable Housing yeah. Act that, that Trump is now trying to have removed so that the suburbs can be safe. Um. <laughs> <laughs> So, Nancy, you have been very reactive to the stories my mother has been sharing. And I do not have a poker face. I'm like all up in it. I was trying, but I am never well modulated. No, I've just been going, I know that there's a lot of connection there. Um, well, one you, of the things she made me think of is that last point. Um, people of my kindred spirit do things out of altruism and compassion and empathy and understanding. But what I learned is that there's a huge population that only does it out of self-interest. And so if you cannot demonstrate to them why they need something to happen, then they will take no action. Uh, her comments also made me wonder, as I mentioned to you the other day, Bonita, I, I was so surprised to hear on the news earlier this week that car sales had gone up enormously. Mm. And where it's true that the car sales people are doing everything they can do to make sales, including like zip for interest. My question was whether a bunch of people who are about to be homeless were buying cars because they know they have to live in them now. Mm. And I don't know the answer to that, but I have my suspicions because where else are they going to go? And winter is coming and the virus is already here. Mm -hmm. So I would really like to know if anyone's doing any research about that. And if they are, I hope they will share it with this group of people um, because we'd like to know. Yeah. Oh, you were going to ask me something, Bonita. So I'm sorry. Did you have a question, darling? Uh, no. <laughs> no, it just... <laughs> 
No, and thank you for sharing that. Certainly it is really hard to buy a car if you are homeless and mm. unemployed. Right. So I, yeah. yeah. Um, well, and the speculators who do have money are, as someone else was saying, uh, going to be buying up all these big houses. I think it was Daryl who was referring to that. They're going to be speculating and buying houses inexpensively. And this is simply going to increase the, the uh, barrier between the haves and the have not, so to speak. So it's already tough. For example, a single person like me back in the housing boom was competing with people who are three and four families living together, pooling their money to pay rent. So I, on my little teeny single salary, coming from the state, no less, didn't have a chance. And that is still true. Uh, so the housing thing already was in difficulty before this happened. And it just is, is very worrisome. Um, I don't know what has happened with shelters since I was doing work with homeless people, but even shelters, most of them did not serve food. Most of them uh, made you leave at six o'clock in the morning and you had to be in line at six at night and there was not going to be enough room for everybody. Um, the shelter in which I did most of my work had 1,400 people in one shelter and one whole floor was for nobody, nobody could live there unless they had a job. But the jobs were paying so little that they could not buy food and pay rent. Right. Mm. So, I mean, that was then, this is much worse. And um, I don't know, I don't think we have anyone coming to the rescue. No. Now that the right, and then you have the, the, you know, of course, with the whole pandemic and trying to keep people to not necessarily congregate and the battles back and forth with that and what is it, ten thousand dollar fees that or or, or um, whatever you call them, the, the yeah, a fine, fine, that's fine. what I'm trying to say, yeah. yeah, which doesn't seem to be helping. But I did want to also add to a little bit to what Nancy was saying. So in one of my former lives, in this lifetime, I was a school counselor. So from that vantage point, I just want to point out that homelessness isn't just on the streets or in the shelters. You have people who are technically homeless, but they may be living with family members or friends, you know, with their, their, their um, children or just with themselves, but they are, they are technically homeless. So that's, that's still an issue. So I just want to make sure people know that now. If this were a time where things were happening, but the pandemic wasn't a thing, wasn't killing us and wasn't, you know, adding to all of the um, political racism that we are experiencing because of Trump, he is a racist people um, and ignorant, which is worse than them anyway. Um, the school systems have in place um, kind of, lack of better wording, safety nets for kids who are technically homeless, you know, and they get foods, uh, food, um, they may qualify for some of the emergency care. Uh, they are not kicked out of school because the parents don't have an address necessarily, you know, their address in the school community. There are professionals designated to help them. I know in um, Montgomery County, and I want to say Prince George's County, um, people personnel workers and other counties they may use social workers to do the same type of jobs but to help to provide you know services i don't know how that looks today how do you do that over zoom you know what i mean like i, I don't know how any of that happens i do know that you know while school um was technically in session over the spring and even this summer um the food service portions of some of the school systems were still providing food you know through multiple which was awesome and i know here in montgomery county i think with uh, i'm probably going to say it wrong but with the hurricane asiaya asiaga whatever i want to say asiago but that's not it i see yeah. whatever it is I see, yes thank you that um i want to say tuesday they sent an email out on monday saying that they were going to suspend the food service on Tuesday. I think Tuesday was the day it really hit hard in mm -hmm. the area. Um, but they had a plan in place. So what they said was, however, we will double up on the food on Monday. So mm -hmm. you go to 
please give twice what you normally get to carry you through on Tuesday. So see what happens when you have a plan and <laughs> you, you care, there's some compassion and you care about people. You know, the, the school system is a system. The government is a system, but this school system, at least some of them plan accordingly. So on a large scale with some effort and some caring and some compassion, you know, we can help humanity out. Mm -hmm. We can absolutely help humanity out. Um, but as we all know, Trump is, is taking us, I'm not even going to say back to a time because I don't honestly think we completely left the time. There are just people who have decided to wake up to the whole racism piece. And, and so for, for people who are not understanding and getting what I'm, when I keep whispering coded language, when Benita refers to um, Trump talking about we're going to get back to suburbia and you don't have to be afraid, it's the coded language for white people who seem to be afraid of people who aren't designated as white, although we are all people. It's catering to their fears. The good thing that, at least from my vantage point, I'm seeing far more people who don't fall victim to that type of manipulation and that negative evil energy. Clearly is represented on this call <laughs> across the world. There are not so many people that, there are people who are still falling prey to that, right? But there are a lot of people who aren't. So a lot of his rhetoric is backfiring on him, which is a good thing for us. I think the tricky part here is the thing we can't control is the pandemic. I mean, and the things that we can control, the idiots who are listening to Trump, and the, and the people who just have this magical thinking that it's not, I don't know why they continue to think it's not real and are sending their kids to school in other states. And even in this county, in this state, in our area, these private school parents, I have no idea who our audience is. And quite frankly, I don't care. But the private school parents who are sitting on their high horses thinking because you have money and you're paying for your kid to go elsewhere, that you're safe and you just have a right to congregate to possibly get the rest of us sick, I'm going to do the shame on you. It's ridiculous. But you're making things worse. You're making you know worse. Daryl, can I speak to this for a moment? Like private school parents aside, wealthy parents who don't want to hang out with their kids aside. Yeah. Um, one of the issues that we currently have with children and now finally articles are coming out showing the short and long-term and permanent effect that children have from, from catching COVID-19. The ones who don't die, the ones that recover, they're showing seizures, uh, uh, immune system inflammation, blood um, yeah, heart blood heart 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 yeah mm -hmm. engorged hearts, um, issues with lungs and um, uh, kidneys, kidneys, yeah, uh, memory lapses, total change of personality. Like, so we are seeing that children, if they don't die from it, they are likely to spend the rest of their life with uh, significant health issues and inabilities to function cognitively. So they may actually become as, um, I hate to say this, it sounds awful, they may become as cognitively impaired as Trump, which... <laughs> it's true, you know, I'm all about truth, Anita. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Um, when Trump determined that we should open up all the states, when people were laid off from work because the states were shut down, they were able to get unemployment from the government to cover the fact that their jobs were not eligible. When the states opened back up and businesses were told you have to open, when they opened, if any employees caught COVID-19 in the workplace, it came under workman's comp and it was paid for by their employers, not by the government. So this is a big thing where, where our government chose to release all sense of responsibility for anyone becoming ill, injured, or loss of income. 
you know, if you lose your income because you're in a stay at home quarantine mandated by the government, then the government helps compensate. If you lose your income because you choose to not catch COVID-19, then you are, you know, now going to be very poor with no support whatsoever. On top of that, so you have people who have to go to work. There are companies that are mandating employees come to work or be terminated. If you have children at home and you leave them alone, then you know your children can be taken away from you. You can even go to jail, which these days jail is even less desirable than normal. So people of low income who have to go to work and their children have to be looked after in one way or another, if the schools are open, the children have to go to school or they have to be registered with an online homeschooling or homeschooling program. And somebody has to be there with them. Exactly. Right. So on top of that, as we're looking at the unemployment numbers, I need to let make sure everyone understands clearly. These are only the numbers represented by people who are on unemployment insurance. There's an assumption that by the time your unemployment insurance is done, you are re-employed. But with the way the economic and employment, uh, um, the way the patterns have been the last decade, really, we've had an increasing number of people who have not been able to reclaim employment. So they've become self-employed or consultants. So they're called employed but they're not really earning an income and they're not employed or they're unemployed and they have no way to earn money, but they're not considered unemployed. So whatever the number of people that's our unemployment, understand the actual number is significantly higher. So I'm just mentioning this, that at the moment, the government has released responsibility of taking care of anyone our unemployment number of 23 million people that they say may become homeless. And as Daryl said, there may be people who have no employment that are not in that category and they have no home. So they're living in the home with the employed person or the financial, you know, the financially responsible person who is trying to pay the rent in that place. So this, are, I'm yeah. sorry. No, please, uh, don't when I was in, among those in charge of pandemic planning for uh, an institution that has thousands of students and hundreds of, of faculty and staff, one of the things we learned about was the Defense Production Act, which this president has totally ignored, and which is the most basic thing that a president of the United States needs to do. What he does when enacting that is to mandate to certain companies that they do things like create PPE or work on the vaccines or work on the curative measures. He also could be mandata mandating uh, companies to do infrastructure like there are about half the country apparently does not have sufficient internet to be able to conduct classes online. He could be mandating that and funding that through the federal government, which would help people stay employed, become newly employed, have the kinds of medical um, PPE that we all need. You know, they keep saying that that's covered, but the fact is it's not covered. Much less should states be having to compete with one another and with other countries. Here we have Jared Kushner sending gazillions of things to other countries that this country needs for its own population. So to me, that kind of thing is inexcusable. It's also solvable, but it's getting like more than a day late now. <clears throat> and um, so my frustration is showing. Back to you, Bonita. <laughs> well, let, me, let, me, let me put that put in the simple terms. Nancy, to everything you just said and everything yes, you said, all of us, is we all know that Trump is stupid. The man is not intelligent. I don't care how anybody else spins it. If they want to challenge me, have at it. The man is not smart. 
even though he is he is clinically a narcissist, being a narcissist doesn't mean to being stupid. He's just plain stupid. Well, I not only agree with that, but it's worse than that because what he combines with it is malignancy. Right, but what, that's what I'm saying is that the man you said is so on point. My my question, well, not even question, my concern, and I guess it is a question, just like a rhetorical question. What I don't understand is why the people around him are so freaking afraid of him and his idiocy. That's the part I don't get. We have all of these other supposedly checks and balances and measures and yada yada, we the people that can check him and force his hand, but for what? I don't know. This guy is totally out of my frame of reference. He has some type of something in his white male supremacy that is scaring a whole bunch of people who otherwise have common sense and could put all of these things in place that you're talking about. I, I'm clueless. I'm clueless that he made it this far, and I'm clueless that he that why he wasn't shut down. The person that I that I go to that I would urge everybody to take a look at because I always forget his last name. Well, not even his last name, the name of his uh, YouTube thing. He breaks everything down so clearly and he lives in Florida. <laughs> when you look at him, you will make certain assumptions, but trust me, he is one of us. His um, YouTube channel is called Bo of the Fifth Column. This Bo, B-O-W? I think it's B-O. I think he just spells it Bo, but it's Bo of the fifth column. He does his show every, I don't know if it's every day at this point, every week. Um, he wears his Curious George hat. He has his beard. The man is super, super, super intelligent and his critical thinking is off the chain. He has dissected everything about Trump. A lot of the things we've talked about, he makes so much sense. And because he has his own version of code switching. I think that Trump's base may think he physically looks like one of them, but he's absolutely yes. not. I so, just put a link of him in the comments. Yeah, both oh. of the columns is, is, is amazing. So he could have solved all of this, but it's the same question. I don't, I, I just, I don't get it. I don't understand. I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if anybody can answer. I don't know. I can tell you we are. a little bit just to mention, you know, in my old life as a chef, I've had several times in the past where I did cook for Trump. Oh, poor thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, his blackmail and bullying tactics are the best I've ever seen. Interesting. Because he's Awful bully. So yeah. And some people are getting awful extremely rich. Some people are getting extremely rich from it too, and they really don't care beyond that. Now yeah. it's like yeah, quite literally for some people. So I can tell you as we're looking at um the American economy, when we hear all, you know, the last few years we've heard the stock market's doing well, the stock market's doing well, as though the average American citizen is hugely invested in the stock market. When you can't pay your own rent each month, you are not investing in stock markets. When I speak with stockbrokers, when I talk with stockbrokers who work on Wall Street, and again, my old culinary, when I cooked for billionaires in New York, um, I have some old connections. They're very, very clear. Those who are doing really, really well buying American stocks and major like buildings in New York City, buildings who's buying up all these buildings that are about to become empty because no one's able to live there to pay rent, not of US. It is mm -hmm. foreign investors. Right. So when the American stock market is doing well, the majority of people it's benefiting are not people who live in our country. And when you talk about the housing market doing well, a huge significant percentage of that are people who are buying American properties, again, who are not mm -hmm. in any way connected to our country except owning it. Right. So glad you made that point because it's almost never mentioned 
Yeah. And I think even the Chinese own some of our major ports, if not all of them. That's commerce ports. You know, think about it. <laughs> Thank you. It's a very big deal. So at the moment, we have Americans on whatever level they live here. We have people who have made their home or were born to their home in the United States who are about to lose any sense of money coming in, any sense of health and welfare support. They're about to become homeless living in the streets. The pandemic is hitting. The children, the elderly, people of all colors, all genders, all living in the streets. Trump, who believes it's in the 1950s, is saying, don't worry, white housewives will protect the suburbs. I don't know, maybe we're going to get funding to put gates around every suburb. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, and I'm glad to hear the response to it is a lot of people saying this is no longer the 1950s. The suburbs are no longer stay-at-home white housewives with, you know, 2.5 children. So we're going into this situation and unless something dire happens, the whole COVID-19 will definitely explode. Mm -hmm. People starving, dying in the streets mm -hmm. will become a commonplace sight no matter where you live. Mm -hmm. And it's already yeah. happening in other countries. Uh, and it's just maddening because what, what is in the Trump budget? Melania wants to refurbish the gardens and the, I mean, we're talking about decorating here and they want to do something for the FBI building so that it won't have to be in competition, so it won't be new and in competition with Trump's hotel across the street. The corruption, Again. I've never known the level of corruption in my okay. life. So let me go back to what Benita was saying, because this is where yeah. I start to get really pissed. I still don't buy that there, as much as Trump may thrive in blackmail and all of his chicanery and all of his bullying, I, I don't buy that nobody has anything on him. I mean, he showed us all who he was. I don't buy it. He, to me, is the classic bully. All you need to do is stand up to him. Back, like, he wants to be in his little mask and not face-to-face. -face. There are so many people who can stand up to him call his bluff and take him down. I do not buy that he is untouchable. This is something that he has created, that he has built around himself and dummies are buying it. Mm -hmm. I buy it. So I'm calling the dummies out. Y'all are created this shit. <laughs> Get us out of it. I, I, don't, I don't buy it. Nobody is untouchable. And certainly nobody who pontificates about how great he is, it, he is absolutely the emperor in his new clothes. The man is naked. We all see it. He don't see it. He don't think we see it. And the people who try to point it out to them, I don't know why they kowtow. But for all of the rest of us, we see it. Mm -hmm. And we say it. I, I, I just truly don't, I, I just truly, I truly don't get it. And in turn, and in, for the people dying in the streets. I mean, we, we started off the conversation talking about unemployment and everything that we talk about really talks about um, how inequitable this country is, right? And how poorly it treats the vast majority of its citizens and how it has its head in the sand with the racism. You talked about, Manita, the government um, uh, isn't, isn't taking care of its people. You know, there are certain times where it, where it will, but that's the history of it. Because the government, the history of the government is that it created itself. Like these men way back created it. They didn't ask permission. They went and stole the land from all of the indigenous people. They've never taken accountability for pushing all the majority of indigenous um, groups onto reservations. Reservations aren't natural. There are some, some, some indigenous groups that actually did die out because they were so small. But the ones that you know about, if folks didn't assimilate into the urban society just to survive, and they decided to maintain that connection and, and went into the reserves, 
because of a promise, uh, all these broken treaties, a promise that the government would actually support. They don't support. The high rates of diabetes, alcoholism, rape, murder on reservations, and, and non-health by the government mm -hmm. and, and state agencies, that stuff was created for the government to continue the genocide on indigenous people. This is true. When Obama and was president, we had a half-hearted apology. I love Obama. And, and he did more than any other president for the indigenous you know, peoples at large in the United States. But this government, this country has never, ever, ever done right by its people. Mm -hmm. Not just black and brown and indigenous, primarily black and indigenous people. But in addition, Appalachian, the poor folks in Appalachia, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The immigrants that initially come over and on the bottom. Yeah. You it's know, never done right by its people. So this isn't new. And the one time indigenous people of the U.S. are held as like, uh, in a positive light is when they are compared to anyone from Central or South America. Like you'll notice we separate and divide and suddenly the indigenous people get a little of that white currency you talk about mm -hmm. because they're better than people who are indigenous from South of the U.S. border. And it's all interesting because it's all Americas. They're, they all have indigeneity, it's all connected. And, and this again goes back to the man-made creation of all of the shit that we're dealing with. The hierarchies, politics, all of this stuff is man-made and created. And it is the protection of whiteness as currency. Right. Nobody on this call possessed whiteness as it was created. Nobody on this possess whiteness as it was created. So everything that we're talking about is the visionary. The, pan the pandemic and Trump's lack of response to it in the way that it should be only heightens all of this divisionary, the divisionary tactics. But it also to me illuminates the, the, the craziness that is part of white supremacy in terms of how it shows up in wealth and uber wealth. Because for whatever reason, these folks feel like they, seem, they don't think that they can be touched. It's a freaking virus that you just breathe on people. Ooh. It can touch anybody. So it's just like, the I don't know, uh, crazy amounts of money e equals the inability to think. I don't get it. Well, I think part of it isn't just about the money. I think the common denominator bottom line is racism. No, if no, no. I'm just making that simple. Yeah, if you can't get, if you can deal with children in cages and you have no problem sleeping at night, there's something basic wrong with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And but the thing is, people don't understand that. You said this earlier, Nancy, or you hinted towards it. There are far too many people at whatever level they identify in whatever way that find it challenging to go deep and to think of things in any substantive critical way that connects them with humanity mm -hmm. so they they can't seem to connect if it doesn't affect them so they think it's not their concern right until it does affect them and then it's faith mm -hmm. should us yeah. or, or worse blaming other people that's big I see Bonita looks like she's looking at the clock. Are we running out of time? We are. I mean, it's not like there's a show following us, but. <laughs> I bet there is in people's houses. They're probably cracking on us like up a store. <laughs> well, you know, I, yeah, it, we are running to the end of the, the time. I did want to say like, normally when we have these conversations, we have some sort of solution or some sort of like, positive concept that people can work with this time we don't have that we have a warning we have a warning that we are going in a direction and hold on daryl um i would like to see as we're wrapping up first nancy and then my mom if there's anything that you would like to share to wrap this and then daryl before we sign off i want to hear your warning though too well, the warning is, I mean, we're going into a very dire situation 
And I think most people are so overwhelmed. Every time you turn, like we're in the throes of one of those crazy horror movies where you're locked in a creepy old mansion and there's no escape. You know, every time we turn around, there's something else that people are shutting down and they don't, they just can't deal with what's happening. However, that's not stopping it from happening. We have laid out some dire situations. There's about to be a lot of people out in the streets with no ability to be healthy. In the midst of a pandemic that is highly contagious with a government that's so busy with their power plays that they're like fighting with each other. They're not helping us. Things are about to get, I think, potentially, unless like before midnight tonight, something happens or, you know, tomorrow, because after tomorrow, the senators and congressmen are gone. Ready to go on. <laughs> exactly. So, um, and you know, whatever they come up with will be a half-hearted patchwork deal just to like reach something before they go on yet another well-earned vacation. Mm -hmm. So Nancy, do you have any thoughts, either anything from your experience in the past or anything at all? And well, then... there's a saying, and I will tell you right up front, I don't believe it. I think only really well off, however I mean that, not just money, people believe it when they say that the Lord never gives you more than you can handle. That is just frankly not true. And a whole bunch of people are going to find that out really quickly. So I think that all we can do is, uh, I saw a suggestion recently, to give as much money as we can to food banks, wh whoever you can, whatever's near you, or whatever kind of assistance you can give there. And above all, vote a new administration in. If, I don't care if you are crawling to the polls, get that vote done, because this country and its democracy will not survive another four years of this. No. Next, <laughs> Earthy, what Earthy. you got to say, girl? <laughs> well, um, I, I'm, other than vote, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, and I'm, I have a right in vote, which I'm going to take right to the place where they pick it up, <laughs> not send it through the mails. And I don't know, I, I just can't, our whole world is in such a sad situation. And yes, the middle class is being bought out by the wealthy. I think about you in Vienna, Virginia, right near us, cute little restaurants couldn't possibly go to them now they're just really cute little personal places and the, the town in the mountains of mexico that we go every winter the artists the musicians they all would survive day to day and i don't know how they're going to i uh, i'm at a loss as to what, other than, as you said, Nancy, give money to uh, people so they can live another day. And there are a lot of wonderful democratic candidates that we give money to. And we just uh, have to survive one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this, you said this country can't take another four years. This country can't take another day. Mm -hmm. Well, without question, if for whatever re reason, and you know what would be illegal manipulation, Trump gets another four years, <laughs> there will be revolution in our country. There's no question. But Mom, I love your idea of get your mail-in ballot and then drive it to the, like for us, it'll be Fairfax County Government Center. So I love the idea of driving the mail-in ballot and putting it in their box in the government center. 
I think that's really good if you can do it since Trump has put his stooge in to slow down the mail and to try to get jam it up. Since some states have laws that say it has to be counted by X date, William Barr has made it clear he will impose a force on that law even if the ballots have not been able to be counted by then. So if you can get it as a mail-in and drop it off at the first legal uh, point of time to do it, I think that's a great idea, Ursi. That is a brilliant idea. And just say you cannot drop it at the polling stations. The polling stations will only do in-person voting. Yeah. You have so one of the things we need to do as a way we can help is to research where they can do it and post that on our social media. Mm -hmm. I've been posting about how you can request a mail-in ballot no matter what state you're in, but we can educate people through our social media that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Daryl, before we leave, do you have any final words of wisdom? I don't know. I mean, I was the whole voting thing. That's a, that's a long game. <laughs> you know, I, I think, I think too, not being afraid for those of us who can to challenge everything, even, even would you say, crony, challenging all of that, you know, um, becoming a little more active, civically and socially, um, however we can, um, and just, you know, sticking together in terms of challenging everything about this administration. Because again, the pandemic, we can control what we can control. And the only things that we can actually control are what we do, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, with the PPEs, the personal protective equipment, you know, if, if, if people have skills and they can sew and they can give away masks and gloves, um, make hand sanitizer or whatever, to the folks who have to leave, I mean, I'm lucky, I'm able to stay at home and teach from home. I don't have to go out, but sporadically for necessities. But keeping in mind those people in your sphere of influence in your circle, who don't have this particular luxury you know, and try our best to, to help our fellow person out um, as, as, as good as we can. Um, and then of course, every effort to get Trump out of, out of office and also calling him out on his trickery and not letting him you know get away with it. However we do that. But the people in the six and seven degrees of separation who have serious dirt on Trump, now is the time for y'all to just come with it. <laughs> don't let him go old school bull bullying. You need to confront him and don't let him get away with that shit. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I've, known I love that. I've known Bonita for a minute, but it's really nice to get to know you other two ladies better on this uh, call. I hope we get to see each other again. <laughs> yes, thank you, Nancy. Yeah. Make it November 4th to celebrate. <laughs> Yeah, let's hope. <laughs> right. uh, well, thank everyone for joining us today. And thank you, ladies, for sharing your insights and wisdom. And, um, you know, everyone stay safe, stay well, you know, take care of yourselves. Bye. Bye. Wear your mask, keep your distance. <laughs>